So, um, and that's actually quite a smart design because it means that as the telescope's turning, you've just got this um, sort of two meter long um, length of wire just able to twist gently rather than it getting tangled up. Um, so we pull all the wiring out so that we can really get that end off um, and getting ready for, for sort of the next stage. So talking about the, so with, with that off, we were ready to start looking at this um, plan that we had for putting the RA um, axis on. So <clears throat> it came time to start looking at that worm. This was the, this was the original worm block that I showed you a picture of before. And it needed to be machined like that. So this is the work that was going to be done to put that extra bit on the end to make it work. So um, uh, Tony and Andreas are working with Packer Engineering and they had this ready to go to machine this block. Uh, but there was a little bit of a problem. Unfortunately at um, Packeranga, you notice this isn't on the telescope. Unfortunately at Packeranga, one of the juniors put the set this up in the, in the big industrial milling machine to be able to do that work. And it came loose and, and the tool gouged it. So, this became, if this was me, I would have just flattened it off and we would have, uh, we would have been good and, uh, and I did that. But perfectionists, Tony and Packering Engineering, they said, no, it's all right, what we'll do is we'll make a new one. So that was what, what was being manufactured. So I'll pack that room, you can have a look. Um, so that was what we had made. So if you remember the pictures I showed you before, so this is the, the original Zeiss worm here. Um, but that's pretty much all it was original, actually. If you remember the picture that I had, uh, it used to have a ball joint on the end there. Um, it was uh, discovered when that, we took that off, Tony discovered that that actually wasn't really going to be suitable. So there's two sleeves being shrunk onto that, uh, and put in this new um, piece of uh, aluminium that was, that was made, as for that other diagram, uh, put on the, the wheel. Um, and it was also discovered at the time that uh, while this worm was in really good condition, see that from there. It wasn't perfectly cylindrical, so I believe that it was put on the lathe and just, just screwed up a little bit. Um, that. So with that sort of planned out and was doing the machining on that, we started to think about what we could do with the, uh, with the, uh, with the declination axis. This is one of the early drawings that Tony did of how we might put the, the, this 15 inch worm wheel on, the, on the, the telescope. This is the axis, this is where the telescope is. And one of our first thoughts were that, um, you've got this break here, that this is where we put the wheel and we maybe map the, the motors to the telescope. That was one potential way. Um, we didn't really understand what it looked like, so once we, we started pulling it apart, we had to get the, oh, sorry, sorry. This part here, uh, this is that break I was talking about, this part here had to come out so we could have a look underneath it. So uh, with a little bit of uh, brute force, this part was removed. Um, we discovered it didn't really look like what Tony's original diagram was, so we had to kind of rethink how this was going to work. So the original idea was maybe we put the, the worm wheel here and then the motor, um, the motor on the telescope. But once we pulled this off, what we actually found, now here's the engineering team actually, so uh, Tony, who's over there, and we've got Andreas, who's the, the CAD wizard, and this is Raj from um, Packering Engineering, who's the, the machinery wizard. So they're all looking quite excited that they've managed to get this out without a crane, <laughs> and get this down to the ground. Um, shower of cold beer. There was, I, didn't, yeah, I wasn't there that time, there was a shower of cold beer. <laughs> so anyway, uh, first look under this deck shaft. Now nobody looked in here for 50 years, it's never been pulled apart when it, the telescope was refurbished. So nobody really knew what was under here. We knew there were some mechanisms to allow the slow motions to get through, but in terms of what it was looking like, didn't really know. So there were two real surprises. One was how complicated the, the sort of planetary gear mechanism was inside this. So we thought there was no gear in there, but it was this really complicated planetary gear set, which allowed you to do the lock, which locked it um, from moving, and, and do the slow motion, and transmit that motion all the way back through the moving of the telescope. Uh, but the other thing that was really exciting that we learned was that uh, when you look at this, and this is that break bit where the lock is, and when we have a tape measure and we measured the inside of this, what we learned was that that diameter was just a little bit bigger than that diameter. That was really 
cool because we suddenly had this thought, what if we put that gear inside this hollow? Then we could really we could have the gear completely hidden inside, which would allow us to, to more easily maintain the stock look. Um, and it'd be really cool. So what we have to do is so we put, put the gear in here. Uh, what we would have to do though is make a cut there so that we can, because we need to get the, the worm gear in the side of it. So it did mean, whilst it was a really cool idea, it also meant that we had to get the crane there. Because the only way to do that is to take this whole declination axis off and put it in the mill and the maze over at Packering Engineering. So the next lift was pulling this all of this off. I've got a video of this one, so that had never been off for 50 years, of course, and uh, get that into the back of Tony's ute to, uh, to get that off to, uh, to the engineering. With the map looking really sad with nothing on it now, just the RA axis, uh, that was actually a perfect opportunity now because there was no machinery out, there was, there was nothing hanging on to the other top, on the top, to start doing some, some delicate machining. <laughs> Uh, on this, this big cast, <laughs> thick cast iron plate to allow us to get this belt through. So, here's Raj with tool number one, a cordless drill and a, uh, and a, a hole on saw. But you can see how thick this, this is, <laughs> how thick the steel is. Uh, it's cast iron, so it, it, it isn't, uh, it, it's not easy to cut by any, any means. So, tool number two into the, uh, into the high power uh, electric drill. Uh, and then tool number three into the angle grinder. <laughs> so, uh, so whilst the, uh, the the other axis have gone off the packering engineering to be put into some high tech um, six axis mills and, and big legs, this was a little bit more manual. Um, finished off by tool number four, Andreas and the file. <laughs> the end result, though, despite all of that um, quite a sort of agricultural way of doing it, was actually a really quite nice hole. <laughs> Um, and, and that's no mean feat. Those guys did an amazing job to be able to cut through that steel and get such a nice um, hole in there. So um, that worm assembly that we got uh, was able to be installed. So you can see this is all this is all a new bit that was manufactured. This is the original holder for it and uh, the original grease um, inlet. There was the plate that was manufactured as well to hold the motors. So essentially at this point we had the ability to be able to drive that, um, that RA axis, the, the right attention axis, using the motors and we did test that so it was great to know the theory. It was still hard for us to know whether that would actually carry the weight. We knew that it would because these motors theoretically can uh, move much bigger telescopes. There's still a bit of nervousness for that. So uh, the bit the big chunk of, of metal that went in Tony's ute to Packering Engineering um, with lots of fancy machines uh, got loaded up on the biggest lathe because it needed to, needed to be turned on this end, needed to be uh, cut. Uh, that's Raj there. Uh, and with some of Andreas's amazing engineering drawings that he did. Um, so you see, we went from having no engineering drawings at all to making some simple measurements to to really quite amazing technical drawings. Now, these aren't just drawings, it's a full 3D model of this. It's really quite amazing, all of it, at, at that detail scale. Um, so th this is some of the work that was being done, some machining of these surfaces in here. One of the things that uh, we also learned, and this was, there was a lot of emails, so yesterday I spent lots of time going back and reading all the emails from the time. Um, this part here, that we, the, the, essentially the, the the worm gear will go around that. This part here was found to not be concentric. So that all had to be. So whilst we were amazed by the Zeiss engineers, not everything was very perfect on that. Um, so yeah, so then it had to go into the mill. Um, so, so to have this area here cut out, see it's all clamped down. They weren't taking any chances on something else coming loose. Actually. Um, much easier to cut through there when you've got machinery to do it. So uh, yeah, there was, there was no angle grinding. Um, but what we still didn't have at this point was how are we going to mount, so we've got this hole, the, the gear's going to go in here, the, the worm's going to come through here, what are we actually going to attach the worm gear to? Um, so that there was nothing that was already there that we could attach it to. 
So it turned out what we need or what we came up with, uh, what Tony came up with, uh, was that we needed a, a new boss. So essentially a big piece of metal um, that we were going to attach the worm wheel to. That would get attached to, um, to the part that moves on the telescope. And, and there'd be a new break on here because we cut through that break that's so going to keep it looking uh, the same. So there'd be a new break on that. But this is about just short of half a meter in diameter. And Tony's telling us, so what we need is, uh, we just need a piece of cast iron that we can machine that's half a meter in diameter. And uh, we didn't have any of those lying around, and there was not enough slide around for background, background engineering. So what we ended up having to do is go to a firm in Tampa, AMG Price. And what they do is they cast things. So they, um, they got one of uh, Andreas's drawings, that drawing we saw before, and they made that part uh, in polystyrene. So they milled it out in polystyrene. Uh, and that's, that part is inside here, uh, packed in sand, and they pour molten iron on that. So in quite an impressive process, getting this, this part made for us. And uh, these guys make railroad stuff. And, uh, they do quite a lot with the content. And, 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 and this was the end result after it was machined. So uh, a big chunk, I mean, it's not small, it's literally this big, um, a, a ductile line cast on it um, was made for it. Um, here it is on the rendering. So this is that 3D model I was talking about that Andreas did. So that's the part that we have made. Um, that's where the gear is just in there. Uh, and this, this is transparent. This is where the cut was made. So all this was doing on here was mounted this new the new brake part, which is the same as this one. And the this was made as well to look like the dice original. Not really needed. So this is where the slow motion controls were. It's not actually going to be used, but we wanted to keep it working. So. so the part came back, another crane, the crane guy plugged us. Uh, and we wish that, and you can see it's now fully assembled. So rather than uh, springing all the parts back here and putting them together, this was all assembled and put together and trued up and shinned and all the other stuff that I don't understand. Uh, all done uh, to make sure this is all ready to go back home. So um, that came back. Guys bolted on. And then the next step, once that was on, was actually put the wire in back. So I don't need photos of this either. So Tony and I spent a day down in the Matariki room with all with about five of the tables lined up, and we had, we decided that the telescope needed to have USB um, and network and power that goes all the way through the telescope and the cameras that we want to fly. So um, we made up this huge cable room where we put it through the original cable path. So coming up the middle of the telescope, going that way, coming out, doing a U-turn, and then coming out there. Did you confirm that it was going to fit through that hole going back the other way? Um, we've done a lot of testing. So um, so the, the actual cables that we put down there, we sort of went through a plan. With, with the telescope off, what we did is we had the, the diameter that we needed to fit it down. Uh, we ended up having to use this um, sleeving though, because we originally used a, we were going to use a hard conduit to put it down there, but that was not fit. Um, that's a close-up of the motor, and but this part here is we had to build a sensor which detects when the telescope's in its home position. So we had to build a vamp for that. So this is some more of Andreas's handiwork. Uh, he designed and 3D printed a, a holder for this little sensor and a holder for a, a metal, a thin metal disc that goes around. Exactly when it's at the home position, and same up here as well. You can just see the top of the red 3D printed um, collar there, and the, the mount for the, for the sensor. And what's the definition of home? So home is an arbitrary position. That's actually a really good question. So um, a lot of telescopes, or well, all go-to telescopes, are going to have some reference point. Often, when you turn a go-to telescope on, you've got to go and do a star synchronization. You've got to turn it on, tell it where I'm pointing, and then from there, it knows how to move to the other stars. The software bisque mount actually takes a slightly different approach. What they do is they, they have, a, and it's any point actually, it's an arbitrary point, but they have a very accurate sensor uh, on, on the two axes. And, and really, it's very simple, but very accurate. And it's a, it's a metal fence, a piece of metal, and then an a, a opto sensor, a light sensor. So 
when you move the telescope, the light sensor is being covered up by this metal, and then it goes into clean space, and it's not being covered up anymore. So do a home, what the, the software businessman does, is it moves the telescope towards the, this fence, detects that it's covered up, and moves it slowly back, and half the speed again, and moves it slowly back, half the speed again, and does a little dance finding this accurate position. From there, it knows where that position is, because you've set that up. So every time you start up, you do a home, and then you don't need to do a start sequence. Very, very accurate. Um, so we're now in a position where we've got this just about assembled, and um, we now needed to, we wanted to test it. So we've got these home sensors in, we've got the motors ready to go, so now we want to drive the whole thing around. But it wasn't balanced anymore because we've just hung, this was, as we said before, we just hung some extra stuff on the end of it. Um, now I had a theory when we, when we put this together that Zeiss would have probably made this so that it was balanced without the telescope or without the camcorder. And as it turned out, when we put it back together, that was actually more or less true, but the extras we added on made it a little bit heavy on the telescope end. So, to the rescue, Tim and I found a <laughs> bottle of soap and a bottle of chocolate sauce, and they were the perfect weights to balance out <laughs> the telescope without the, the telescope mount without the telescope on. And that was on there for about three weeks. Brilliant. Perfectly balanced. With that, we, um, we could drive the mount around, we could test that the, uh, the motors were doing the right thing, we could test that this home sensor worked properly, uh, and get to the point where we're confident enough for the telescope to come back. So yet another frame came back. Telescope back on, <coughs> counterweight back on, there's those high bolts that we now own. Um, and everything just about back together. Still no mirrors, still no accessories. We got the telescope on and the camera away. Um, we couldn't drive it around in this position, we had to put the mirror back in. Um, so the mirror um, did need a little bit of cleaning. I did a little bit of cleaning on the mirror, but it does need to be resurfaced at some point soon. Um, we had to run these cables that we'd run in here. So we run the cables neatly through the inside of the telescope tube. So there's a bit of work involved in that. Um, got the mirror, mirror back in. Um, and then there was another job that, once that was done, there was another job that we already got the parts for, that Grant didn't talk about in his, in his, his stuff. What we also want to do is make sure the dome, which has always been motorized from, from when it was installed, actually tracked with the telescope way. So we had a new um, drive controller mounted on there, because it used to be really, really harsh. So we got a, a new three-phase speed controller mounted in there, um, and also uh, the circuit <laughs> on there as well. There's uh, Tony doing something incredibly technical with something. Um, I didn't have the photo, so I can't remember what he was doing. I was busy staring into the cupboard. Um, so there's four here, which is called MaxDog 2, which interfaces with the, uh, the Sky software and the telescope mount so that the dome will always be pointing in the same place as the telescope. So now you don't need to turn the dome around. Can I just say something? I noticed that um, Grant was talking about um, money for furniture, but there you're using the original the, the, chairs. So they are the original price chairs. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and yeah. in fact, yeah, so we're all kind of attached to these chairs. They're, they're very yeah. good. They're, they're not in the dome at the minute, but the Zeiss wheelie chair is still in there. Yeah, so we've been talking about getting new furniture and actually we're kind of umming and eyeing because it would actually probably be really cool just to refurb these because uh, they look so awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're so old that they're now looking new again. I mean, they're, they're a real retro call. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going to stop talking soon because I'm just about done. But uh, it was just really then a case of getting all the covers back on. We have 3D printed covers there. You see it in another photo later. Um, to where there was a little bulge where the, where the wheel comes through. Um, do some collimation. So this is me doing some collimation of the, of the telescope. with uh, This is a Takahashi collimation scope. But it's got a, I attach a camera to it. You can see on the screen makes life a lot easier. Uh, I'm not bored with that, but if you're interested, ask me about it. Um, mirrors back in. We also put some new doors on here. Now the doors is an interesting story all on itself. Um, two things. One, we always because the intention is to make this telescope remotely operatable. We said from the start we need a way to be able to open and close these doors. But these old doors are really, really heavy, so we were going to deal with that problem. Anyway, what we, what we did when we pulled the telescope apart is we wanted to get a paint. There was a stupid bit of paint touch-up um, that we needed to do. So um, Grant said, oh, perfect idea. I work with a company who makes spray cans and they can color match. So 
well, what I'll do is I'll take a random part from some of these lights and we'll get a color match. So we took one of the doors and we took them off. Unfortunately, Grant's car got stolen with the door in it. <laughs> so we now no longer had two doors. So we ended up having to make some more doors. Here they are closed. Um, so these doors have actually got the motor. You can quite see the motor off here. Um, and that's going to be set up. It's actually not driven yet because we, until we put the power through, we, we connect up the power. So those doors will slowly open, sort of like that. So for the remote operation, remote operation means we don't keep the telescope uncovered. Um, we tidied up all the wiring. We mounted the, the BIS control system. This is the box here that's mounted to the side of the telescope with a 3D printed mount. Um, these you can see some of the wiring that's coming through. Some of this still needs to be completely tidied up and finished. Um, we're replacing the LED, we're replacing all these lights. We're putting the lights back in even though they're not needed. So uh, I'm working on LEDs to go in there. We're going to keep the original switch to turn them on and off though, which is kind of mm. cool. Uh, we tied up the wiring to the control to the to the motors. Um, keep all that out of the way. Uh, you see, there's some three D printed covers here just to cover up the moving cart. There's the other motor. It's a big three D printed cover. Um, and that's basically what it, what the finished thing looks like. Drive it is called the Sky X. Um, so it's a, so it's a software that the company software this writes. So in fact, the company that makes the management the controllers is really a software company more than a hardware company. But they decided to develop hardware that goes with the great software they've got. It's actually the way that they work is um, most telescope mount manufacturers they build a they build a telescope mount and they put all of the smart stuff on board the telescope, and that's the stuff that gets out of date. So your list of objects and things like that, so you're quite limited. And they give you this hard to use hand controller um, that you can maybe find an object and do a go to. With the best maps, they're really designed to be used with the, with a computer all the time. And in fact, most people who are using a go to really don't use the hand controller. So software best took a different tack. Rather than putting the, the list of objects and the hand controller with the fiddly buttons into the maps, they have a really good software program that's got the intelligence to move the, the map, and really the, the driver electronics is really just a motor interface for the software. And I presume that handles meridian flips without too much of a problem? Yeah, although we can track quite a long way past the meridian. Uh, in fact, we can track a lot, lot, lot further past the meridian than I've currently got it set up to do. Um, so it's not really going to be a problem. Because I remember when we were pushing the telescope around, if we want to get from one side to the other, we had to basically turn yeah. the whole thing around and... So, in terms of using it now, literally all you do is you go into the Sky software, which is planetarium software, looks like Stellarium, if you're familiar with that. Um, you click on an object and you click salute. And the telescope will move. At the same time, the dome will move as well. Not necessarily in the same direction, depending on which way it's going. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll meet in the middle. So you don't even worry about that. The, the software will prevent the telescope from going below the horizon. It will prevent the telescope from going in the position where it will damage itself. It will prevent the telescope from going the wrong way. Yeah, that was the next thing I was wondering about. Was, uh, the, camera at the, um, the camera at the one end and well, um, my head hitting the mount, that sort of thing. It, can't, well, it physically can't hit the mount. The, the design of this telescope is it's, it's an offset German equatorial. Yeah. That means it's a, there's quite a long stick that separates the telescope from, from the pier. Uh, and it's in any position, even with the camera on the back, so the camera sticks off the back probably that much, it cannot hit the map. It's just, it's not possible. You did that out though. We did test that though, we were interested. But it's about that far. I mean, at its closest point, it's about that far. Now, of course, if you've used the Zeiss before, you remember that motor that used to take. And you remember doing the Zeiss limbo, trying to get in between that motor and the eyepiece. Uh, kind of see it. That shelf where the motor was is no longer there at all. So, uh, so it's a lot easier to move around there and there's, there's more space. So how long does it take to get from one, end of the sky, one side of the sky to the other? That will be a maximum school time. And it's about 30, 30, 40, 30 40 seconds. Yeah. So it's pretty fast. It's, um, it's, it's certainly not so. Uh, in fact, we figured probably about the same speed, if not faster than the research. 
Still yeah. Yeah. So it's not too different. About the other telescopes lose at about three degrees per second. So so most things you're not going from one side of the sky to the other. That's the sort of worst case scenario. Yeah. 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 So typically moving from target to target, point to point, you're in maybe ten or fifteen seconds. Mm -hmm. Lose typically will be what you and, and that's not by accident. All the maths was done by Tony over there to work out what gear reductions and ratios we needed to move it at the right speed. So, so, so I mean, I've you know I've kind of because there was so much to get there. I've, I mean, I've not covered everything we did, but there was a lot of head scratching. There was a lot of working out. There was a lot of things that we didn't know what we were going to do. Go backwards and forwards, looking at um, you know, energetic <coughs> ratios on encoders and all kinds of things we have to do. Um, one thing I didn't mention actually, there is still some work to do. We are going to motorize the shutters on the dome, so that's a work in progress. So we're looking at exactly how we do that, we have the electronics to do it, we're just looking at how we do that in a mechanical sense. Um, and we have currently got a bit of a problem with it, we had a fault um, with the computer and it looks like a fault with the, with the boards, uh, the, the actual control boards. So whilst it does move around, we can't connect the computer to it at the minute, but we have a new board on its way from the stacks as we speak, should be arriving any time to, to rectify that. Uh, again, the software, um, at the sales support from the software best we can examine for it. Have you done any um, testing, lots of testing like on tracking the nature of these and variable number lengths and stuff? Well, like in, 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 the, in between the rain, because, <laughs> because we had this operating at just about the same time all the weather went to. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's not very good. Custom, that's good. That's a great word for you. Um, so we, uh, the tracking, I mean, the, the map geometry itself in terms of the RA axis hasn't changed and we've known that it was always tracked very well. Um, so the geometry is good. Um, the motors are designed to be very, very accurate uh, and we set them up to the, to the right encoder counts and things like that. So the tracking is really, really good. We haven't done any really long term tests yet. Um, we've done a very loose pointing model. So, when, uh, so just to explain that, maybe he doesn't know. In order for the telescope to know exactly where it's pointing in the sky, uh, it has a database essentially in the software, but it also, um, you, you run something called a pointing model which essentially trains the computer to the geometry of the map. So mm -hmm. make sure that when you point, this is what Grant was saying before, the research scope, if you've got you know, Jupiter this big, you can point to an accuracy of that much. So once we've done that, once we've had enough clear sky to be able to do that, we should get the same accuracy on there as well. So yes, it's tracking fine, it tracks perfectly, so we've had it on and we had it on satin all night, and it's fine, it just stays in the center of the field as you expect. So, how much adjustments did you have to do the counterweight to compensate for the extra mass of the. Well, about so that the counterweight is on a, is on a screw thread, and, and the amount of adjustment we had to make is really the weight of the bottom of soap and the bottom of chocolate sauce. So, it turns out we moved the, we moved the counterweight out by about that much. <laughs> So it's a 200 kilo can of weight, we moved it out about that much, and that equals just the same weight as a bottle of soap and a bottle of sauce. <laughs> have you told Dice that you've done this, and have you patented your design? Um, because there must be other telescopes like this out there, so... Um, there are, so there's uh, um, Concoli in Hungary has got one exactly the same, there's uh, Germany... There's about 20. Yeah, there's about 20 telescopes that are very similar. Um, and one of the things that we've talked about is actually reaching out to all those observatories yeah. and telling the story uh, and seeing if anybody wants to share information. Um, so, I mean, we have to talk with Tony and Andreas who really owe the copyright for all the fantastic engineering drawings. But um, it, it occurs to us that, you know, I mean, this is quite a, a really useful upgrade. I mean, the, the equipment's still a really good working telescope and just be able to bring it into the future is, you know, I mean, and it's cost overall about 100k probably has been spent including the camera, um, so which you know, is, is a lot of money but it's not a lot of money, uh, <laughs> certainly for, for getting, for, for, a, for a facility that's got a, a, a telescope like this. I hope you're going to have a plaque, we are information so about what great work you guys have all done. Well, really we're, really proud of we're more interested in having a plaque to actually on <laughs> Edith Winstop Blackmore without you know without her donation this wouldn't exist. Yeah, so right. the, um, the 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 four bolts on the front of the of the of the pier where the shelf used to go for the for the noisy motor, which if anybody's interested, Tim has got a recording of the, the noisy motor <laughs> and we're considering whether we have a button that we can push to play <laughs> 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 
But where that shelf was, uh, we talked to the startup manager about getting a, a brass plaque to, to, to actually just something to signify the, the telescope and the work that's happening. How about using that as a ringtone? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, actually, I would say that you should actually have sound action. It's sort of like like the uh, doctor preferring the um, background noise of the TARDIS. <laughs> so we used to it after a while. Well, yeah. 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 And that previous uh, picture that you just switched away from. Oh. Can you go back to it? Yeah, yeah. I can. You just might want to point out that 3D printed cover over the gear. Yeah. That you mentioned before, but we didn't look at under the light there. Yes, sir. No. Thank you. Oh, you can oh, see it there. Oh, that's sorry. The one, that, oh, yeah, this one here. That one there. Oh, yeah. That's the cover that's been 3D printed to allow that uh, last um, belt yeah. to return. 3D printing is a really great asset to yeah. be able to. So just cut the end off one of those. Uh, yeah. Cut a gap in one of those new colors, and that's the so that was my, my contribution to three D printing. Actually, that, that's not a very good one. Is this base, which is uh, which is a it's a uh, a cone shape. So it, it's mounted on the on the side there, and it's not um, it's not cylindrical. So that allows us to put the uh, that's, that goes in behind there. So yeah, three D printing has been a really really helpful. Um, Andreas has got a better three D printer than I've got. Yeah. Oh, one thing I was going to mention, um, one website I came across for an observatory in Hungary that had one of these. Yep. And the scope, the scope over here is obviously um, at the use because they had a latest model S big camera on it. But yeah. it was still yeah. manual push through the system. Yeah. Incidentally, this is the, uh, the 3D render of uh, mm -hmm. the Andreas that I'm telling you is just a <laughs> So everything's in there. So you know the three D printed <laughs> parts that we did for the uh, for the sensor. That's the three D printed part in there. That's the other three D printed part from the other sensor. Um, that's the the boss that we had made. That's the three D printed cover that covers the worm gear. Uh, this plate was manufactured as well, just to, for, to allow us to keep the um, the slow motion mechanism there. Not that we use that. It was actually disconnected, but it's just keeping that mechanism there to keep. Yeah, so there was, there's a lot of work. I mean, this is, this is way beyond my skills. I can just about drive it, turn it around, and, uh, and do some basic 3D printing. But, uh, but yeah, what's great is that we started with no engineering drawings whatsoever, and what we've ended up with is a really detailed, you know, we can do sections and slices through this. So this work is now properly documented for if somebody comes to do anything with this into the future. It's really, you know, really important. Steve, I'm interested in your point about the influence of Blackwell's legacy. The original, I just looked up for the original $7,000 it was about $360,000 shaving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's so a sizable, sizable request. The extra bits of half a million dollars, I think. Yeah. So the society is about 180000 So yeah, if you can imagine us trying to raise half a million dollars to, to put a telescope in today, it would be no mean feat. So think about the challenge to, uh, to get this in and you know without it you know we wouldn't be here this society wouldn't be here uh, in this building cool.